Good morning. It is another wonderful morning to sing the praises of God, but I don't think there's any morning that isn't a good morning to sing the praises of God, even when it's snowing and, bliss and blizzarding outside. Well, our, uh, our scripture reading for today has covered the first little bit of my sermon, and in, previous, in the previous past couple of weeks, we have looked at the book of Jude. We're going to continue doing that today, and today we're going to be doing a sermon on a single verse, which is Jude 11. Let's turn there together and read it. Woe to them, for they have traveled in the way of Cain, have abandoned themselves to the error of Balaam for profit, and have perished in Korah's rebellion. Now, in this verse today, we see Jude lay out three examples of grievous sin before the Lord. These are the sins of Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Now, sometimes when we read scripture, we just continue to read on without pondering the significance of what each of these characters represent. Jude, in his writing, assumes his readers know precisely what the sin of Cain, the error of Balaam, and the rebellion of Korah represent. And we can be guilty at times of simply turning the page, knowing that these characters in the Bible were examples of sin, but leave our exploration to them at that. However, I think it is vitally important that we examine why Jude mentions these three men specifically and the reason he uses the terminology that he does when he brings them up. For, I th for it is by the careful study of God's word that we are able to uncover what God is trying to tell us in Jude 11. At times, we must dig deep and do more than a surface reading of scripture to really bring out what what we see in the text. Now, as we dig down into this verse, the first thing that we should be asking ourselves is, what is the sin of Cain, the error of Balaam, and the rebellion of Korah? And what is God trying to communicate to us by these examples? Well, the first of these characters is m mentioned in this passage is Cain. Most of you already know well who he is. He is known as the very first murderer who struck down his brother in cold, cold blood. One way to apply this verse in that same manner is that Cain murdered his brother and false teachers, it, false teachers murder the souls of others. And that's the sort of cursory reading of this one passage. However, I think to stop here and read on would be a mistake because it also speaks against the attitude of Cain. Now, sit with me for a moment and think. If one loves their brother, they don't suddenly decide to bash their brother's head in with a rock. They don't go from happy relationship to killing blow due to a single incident. If one had a temper, one might strike in rage and kill his brother, but that is not the type of murder that Cain seems to commit. If we go to Genesis 4, verse 8, we read that Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. What we see here is this murder wasn't one out of instant rage, but rather was premeditated and planned out. Cain purposely brought Abel to a field, possibly away from other witnesses, so that he could kill his brother. Now, M now Michael Green writes, this speaks more than s of more than simple jealousy, but rather it shows a pattern of unlovingness toward his brother. Cain was the type of unloving man who cared nothing for his brother and envied him because Abel's deeds were good and his own were not. A murderous life does not simply come out of a vacuum. 
And Cain was most likely an unloving, hateful individual before he murdered his brother. This is why Hebrews 11.4 expresses that God accepted the offering of Abel and not of Cain. If we turn to Hebrews, we, say, we read, By faith Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was approved as a righteous man because God approved of his gifts, and even though he, he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. Now, no direct indication is given in Genesis 4 of why God disliked Cain's offering and accepted Abel's, and scholars have debated that for centuries. But I think Hebrews sheds light on this by suggesting that the acceptance and rejection of the two men's offerings had to do with their attitude and manner of life. If Abel was based, if Abel's blessing was based on a pure heart and one that was faithful towards God, Cain's was rejected for the opposite reason. Again, some will say that, uh, say that Abel's was a blood sacrifice and Cain's was one that was fruit from fruit of the land. But we must keep in mind that there's no definite indication in these passages that the offering was an atonement offering. And, and if it wasn't an atonement offering, Cain's gift would have been perfectly permissible. For the people of Israel would give grain offerings and peace offerings and tithes toward the Lord in form of all manner of food. Yet in some way, both Cain and Abel knew God's judgment and approval on their gifts. Acceptance of Abel's gift is clearly linked with approval and righteousness, which is in turn linked with the more acceptable sacrifice. The righteousness of this seems to consist of a right attitude and heart to which is pleasing to God. Now, even if this is an atonement offering which requires blood sacrifice, Cain's heart was still not right before God because he decided to do things his own way. He would be, provide God with the sacrifice that he thought was best instead of the sacrifice that the Lord required. One author suggests that Cain's sacrifice was probably more pleasing to the senses than a carcass of a dead lamb. But his sacrifice was offered without faith and therefore was unacceptable to God. You can give to God whatever you have, but the most important point to stress is that we, when we give to God, must offer it up in faith. So either way, whether the sacrifice in Genesis 4 was an atonement offering or a tithe or a gift to God, God saw Cain's heart in the offering and he rejected it because he was not right before the Lord. Whether it was not right simply because of the heart or because of the heart and a failure to subscribe to proper atonement sacrificial practices, he still was not right before God. What kind of picture then does this paint of Cain? He is one who lives religiously, yet does not have his heart right. Who does Cain represent? He is the one who gives offerings to God, and yet thinks about murder in his heart and, ra and has rage jealousy towards his brother. He is one who walks the walk and talks the talk, but who has not allowed the Spirit of God to penetrate his heart and take his heart from death to life. He is the one who is in the way of unbelief and empty religion. Now, again, it doesn't matter who you are or how much money or sacrifice that we give, if our heart is not right with God and we don't provide the sacrifice to him in faith, it will be ultimately unacceptable before the Lord. Ultimately, Cain's pride is not found in his relationship with God, but rather in his station before others, which explains why when he was rejected and brought a notch down by God, he was so jealous of his brother. 
his sanctimonious bubble had been popped, and all he could do was look over at his brother and desire for the recognition and honor Abel had been given by God. Ultimately, the sin of Cain is not only the sin of murder, but at its root, is, it is the sin of dead religion. Guzik states, many Christians are afraid of secular humanism or atheism or the world, but dead religion is far more dangerous and sends more people to hell than anything else. These certain men were in the way of Cain, which is dead religion. It is this dead religion that of Cain that we as Christians must be mindful of. Do not go through the motions, but instead continually each and every day get your heart right before God so that your sacrifices would be pleasing to the Lord like Abel. We see the epitome of Cain's hard heart when he lies and retorts back to God, am I my brother's keeper? He is so angry and hardened that he does not even feel sorry for what he has done. And when God confronts him, he has the nerve to answer God, the creator of the universe, with a sarcastic and off-handed comment. What does this tell us, though? Well, at the heart of Cain's sin was an attitude that was unwilling to submit to God. And in place of that relationship, Cain placed his worth in religious acts, rather than to the one whom the religious acts were supposed to glorify. Unbelief and empty religion often leads to jealousy, dissatisfaction, and anger towards the ones who are truly godly. We must be careful to give all of our hearts, all of our minds, and all of our bodies and souls to the Lord, dying daily to ourselves through the enabling power of the Holy Spirit so that our hearts would be soft towards God and others. This is the ultimate antidote for the sin of Cain, for any sin, really, but the sin of dead religion is directly counteracted by a live relationship with God. If you want to keep from the sin of Cain, pursue your relationship with the Lord. Pray to him each day. Read your Bible and study God's word. Don't do it out of obligation, but learn to love the Lord. Abide in him, knowing that he abides in you. Some can give much in their sacrifices and others little, but it is the faithful and pure and upright in heart that the Lord most desires, because that is what Abel was, that's the, that's the sacrifice that Abel offered up. Now, on to our second character. Our first two scripture readings earlier were in the service were about Cain and Korah. Now, I want to turn to one small section of scripture on Balaam before seeing what his sin was. Turn with me, please, to Numbers 31, verse 15 to 16. Have you let every female live, he asked them? Yet they are the ones who, at Balaam's advice, incited the Israelites to unfaithfulness against the Lord in the pure incident, so that the plague came against the Lord's community. Now, this is a short passage that we have mention of Balaam in. Now, most of us perk up our ears and remember the story of Balaam and the talking donkey. If you remember how it goes, Balak, the king of Moab, is afraid that the Israelites will overpower him because they are much stronger than he is. He knows that he can only defeat them and be safe from the Israelites' hands if they are cursed. So he hires the prophet Balaam to do just that. After Balaam comes to Balak, through a rather remarkable journey involving a donkey talking to him, he comes to the mountaintop from which he might curse the people of Israel. 
he attempts to. But then, out of his mouth flow blessings. Well, then he goes to another mountain and opens his up, up his mouth to curse Israel again. And again, he blesses them. This happens again and again. All while God warns Balaam not to betray the people of Israel for profit. For each time Balaam's curse fails... Balak offers him more power, prestige, wealth, and position if he will simply curse the Lord's people. After the third blessing, instead of curse from Balaam upon the people of Israel, King Balak becomes incensed at Balaam. For instead of cursing the people of Israel, Balaam has done the exact opposite. We read in Numbers, starting from chapter 24, verse 10. Then Balak became furious with Balaam, struck his hands together, and said to him, I summoned you to put a curse on my enemies, but instead you have blessed them these three times. Now go home. I said I would reward you richly, but look, the Lord has denied you of reward. Balaam answered back to Balak, didn't I previously tell the messengers you sent me, if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go against the Lord's command to do anything good or bad of my own will? I will say whatever the Lord says. Now I am going first back to my people, but first let me warn you what these people will do to your people in the future. Now, at this point, we see that Balaam has tried to sin by cursing Israel, but he has not succeeded. He has gone against God's commands, but he, God has prevented him from using his tongue to pronounce a curse upon Israel. It is what he does next, however, that earns him a top spot in the Bad Example Awards. Balaam realizes that he cannot curse God's people, but he wants the rewards that King Balak is offering to him so badly that he will do anything to betray the people of God. So he hatches a plan that will get Israel in trouble with God. He tells Balak that instead of trying to have a prophet curse Israel, that he should lead Israel into fornication and idolatry. Because the people of Israel were to be a pure people before the Lord, this fornication and idolatry would then cause God to curse a disobedient Israel. Balak did just that, sending his young and beautiful women into the camp of Israel to tempt the men of Israel into sexual immorality. But before the Israelite men could have sex with them, they would ask the men to worship, worship the Moabite gods and idols. By doing this, Balaam influenced the people of Israel to sexual immor immorality and idolatry. The result of the people of Israel's sin was that God did indeed curse Israel, and he brought a plague of judgment upon them that killed 24,000 people. Therefore, Balaam was guilty of this great sin. He deliberately led others into sin. Worse yet, he did it for money, prestige, power, and personal gain. This story is a sad one, but it is one that we must be careful to keep away from. The world often tempts us with money, fame, or power to give up our biblical principles. At times, it will encourage us to do something wrong so that we can have a following or be popular with workmates, schoolmates, or others around us that do not live lives that are in line with the Word of God. There are believers who have backslidden at times in their lives, and they have drawn others with them into their backsliding. I have known Christian people who, for popularity's sake, have gone into wild living, and while doing it, dragged other Christians into that same lifestyle. They would goad others to join them, deliberately leading them into sin. They eventually repented and came back to the Lord. But some of those people that they led into sin, 
for the sake of their popularity and a good time, still haven't returned to the Lord. That is an incredible weight to carry on the conscience of those people. We must keep in mind that each and every one of us are examples of Christ, and we must be vigilant not to lead others into sin. Perhaps some of the greatest fatalities to this type of sin are some of the large prosperity gospel teachers. They purposely mislead those to follow them so that they can obtain a private jet or their own islands. I shudder to think of the fate that awaits those who have not only trampled underfoot the Son of God, and, but who have also had a hand in encouraging and leading others to profane the blood of the covenant. One verse that I immediately think of is Hebrews 10, verse 29 to 31, which reads, How much worse punishment do you think one who, who will deserve, who is trampled on the Son of God, regarded him as profane, the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and insulted the spirits of grace. For we know the one who has said, said, Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And then we read in Matthew 18, verse 6, when Jesus says, But whoever causes the downfall of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. These are heavy words, but as Christians... We must avoid the greedy error of Balaam by refusing to sell out our faith and those around us for the sake of profit and also by refusing to support those that do. Finally, the last character discussed in this verse is Korah. Korah's story begins in Numbers chapter 16. And I'll read the first three verses of, of that. Now Korah, son of Izhar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, with the Danthan and Abram, sons of Eliab, and on the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took 250 prominent Israelite men who were leaders of the community and representatives in the assembly, and they rebelled against Moses. They came together against Moses and Aaron and told them, You have gone too far. Everyone in the entire community is holy, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the Lord's assembly? Now, in this passage, Korah was a Levite, but not from the priestly family of Aaron. As a Levite, he had his own God-appointed sphere of ministry, yet he was not content with it. He wanted the ministry and authority of Moses. Korah was bucking against the order that God had specifically set in place for the leadership of Israel at that time. Korah needed to learn this essential lesson that we should work hard to fulfill everything that God has called us to. But at the same time, we should never try to be what God has not called us to. Unfortunately, he did the opposite of that. The rebellion of Korah lies in the broader idea of a contemptuous and determined assertion of self-will, and ambition against divinely appointed authority. There are people out there that are very anti-authority and who love to reject the fact that God has set an order in his church. Yet when we read the Bible, we see the church is meant to have a particular order. Some are gifted in leadership or administration. They are to be pastors, deacons, and evangelists. 
But there are others who have gifts of service and hospitality or other less immediately publicly visible, visible spiritual gifts. One gift is not greater than the next, and one person is no more valuable than the next, but each is given his own very important role to play in the body of Christ. One person may be the mouth, but without the foot, he is not able to walk where he needs to walk so that he might speak the message. The unfortunate thing is, is that people often can become envious of leadership because as a result of being more in the public eye, it does give a certain amount of power, control, or prestige. But I know many churches that have split over gossip, rebellion, and dissension because people desired more power and influence in the church than they were given to at the time, failing to see how genuinely useful they were to the body in their current position. I would not be in this pulpit if it were not for the support of the congregation. And each of you are vital to the body of Christ, just as Pastor Jim or the church elders are. God gives each and every one of you a gift to use. So keep from the rebellion of Korah, which is discontentment and leads to disunity. Instead, we must keep serving God faithfully, knowing that not all are leaders, but you may be there to help the leaders stand. What if Korah came to Moses and Aaron and instead of trying to usurp their authority, said, I want to be more involved in ministry in the Church of Israel. How can I help? I think the story would have gone a lot more differently. In conclusion, we must be careful to stay away from the sin of Cain, which is false religion, the error of Balaam, which is the desire for material gain and the leading others astray, and the sin of Korah's rebellion, which is the upsetting of the order in the church. There are, these are three sins that can have grievous consequences for both the Christian and all around them if they are allowed to take root and they must be immediately recognized and plucked out before they have the opportunity to do so. God calls us to live in a manner in which the letter of Jude begins with, as servants of Christ. As long as each and every day we humble ourselves before the Lord and allow his word to transform our hearts and minds through the reworking of the Holy Spirit, we will be empowered to live a life in which we as Christians may avoid the pitfalls of the temptations of these sins. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word and the warning that it gives us today about the sins of Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Help us tend to the garden of our hearts through the inworking of your Holy Spirit, so that any root or weed of these sins will be taken out so that we may serve you in a manner that communicates the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give us your strength, Lord, for we are but men and cannot do anything by our own account. But we know that with you and the working of your power through us that you will steer us away from evil and enable us to live a life which glorifies your name in which you are building within us to become our one and only true desire. We pray that you, Lord, would be glorified above all other names. In Jesus' name, amen.